Well, last week we began a four-week series I've called 2020 Vision. And I'd like us as a church to key in on what will be required to step into God's plan for us as a church over this next phase of life. We began the series asking you, our dear church family, to be a part of our prayer force. Everything we do must be born in prayer. Amen? That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why it's so impactful when we come together and we pray. Prayer is where we get our marching orders from the Holy Spirit. I see too much in churches nowadays where we get good ideas, but the good ideas aren't born of the Spirit. All of our ideas must be born of the Spirit before we act. Prayer is where we form a spiritual unity. Prayer is where we push back the darkness in territories we are going. So we must come together in prayer. If we as a church can grasp the power and the importance of praying strategically, passionately, and consistently, we will see revival in our community, and we will see lost people come to Christ in droves. If my people, amen? amen. Well, if you're away last week, please go on our church's Facebook page or YouTube channel uh, to check out last week's message. That way you can get all caught up. Well, this morning I'd like to talk about becoming intentionally connected. Touch your neighbor and tell them we're connected. We're connected. And let me just state up front, and forgive me, I have no idea what time it is, because that back screen isn't working. Five till. We're in a lot of shape. Pastor can preach long this morning. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Becoming intentionally connected is very easy for some people. Some of you in this room, you're just bubbly personality types. You really are. Wave at me if you know you're bubbly. Okay, because everybody else knows you're bubbly. Everybody else knows. The truth is, we need those bubbly personality types. We need you. Because many more people are probably like me, and I am not a bubbly personality. I don't typically like to talk to strangers. Maybe it just stuck with me from being a child. Don't talk to strangers. And I just, I held on to that till an adult. I don't know. I personally, I really have a difficult time making conversation out of thin air. I don't know if you do this or something like this, but I drive myself nuts because my uncomfortable conversation moment with people seems to always go towards talking about the weather. Does anybody else have, you have an uncomfortable go-to conversation? Well, those storms were really intense this last week. That's translated to you. If I, if I start talking about the weather, you just learned something about your pastor. I don't know what to say. Okay? I don't know why I go this way. I don't, I don't know why that's a habit in my life. Um, but I struggle sometimes connecting with people I don't know very well. And all my fellow introverts said, Amen. Amen. However, all of us must recognize, myself included, that just because we have certain personality dispositions does not exempt us from the need to be known or the need to be connected to other people. Loneliness is one of the greatest hurts within our community. Did you know that? Loneliness. We have never been so connected with people as we are today, and yet we have never been so alone. We need each other, and our community needs us. We must become intentionally connected. That's, that's one of the things why uh, Pastor Michael mentioned that next, uh, or, I'm sorry, Sunday, October 6th, we're going to have a newcomer's lunch together where we want to connect with you. If you've just been coming for a couple months or recently, we want to get to know you because we believe in connecting with people. So join me for some pizza and a time of connection on Sunday, October 6th. I promise that's the last announcement from the message this morning. But I want to show you this morning a couple things out of God's Word as we build out how we are going to do that as a church going forward. I'm going to set our foundation and then give some action points as we build. So, so one of the questions this morning is how are we going to become intentionally connected with each other and our community? And I'd like you to take your Bibles. You can't cheat this morning and watch the screen. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 13, if you would. 
We're going to start there at verse 34, John chapter 13, verse 34. If you don't have your paper Bible, please feel free and get out your smartphone. Just don't click the play button. Let me read it to you. John chapter 13, we're going to read verses 34 and 35 to start. And then we'll go to another passage here in just a moment. It says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So this is Jesus talking to his followers. Jesus did not tell them here that, hey guys, I'm going to give you a suggestion that I hope you keep. He did not say, he was not saying, guys, can't we just all get along? You know, this passage here, I feel like I live this in my home with my children. If you've got children in your home, this is going to relate for just a moment here. And let me preface that I believe that we have amazing children. I'm going to say that. I'm going to brag on my kids for just a moment. I love them dearly. They love Jesus. They love you. They like to talk to you. At least a few of them do. Those who are more like me kind of are a little bit quieter, but they love you. They're great. But you know, all children are still human. And sometimes my children can nitpick and get catty with each other. I'm sure no other siblings in here have done that with each other. Well, sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what's going on with my voice. Sometimes they get going with each other. And dad has to step in and say, stop it. Get along with each other. Get along. Stop fighting. Stop bickering. Stop comparing yourselves to each other. Stop talking about your sister behind her back. Stop it and get along. Have you had any of those conversations this week? This is dad coming in and saying, hey, this is not an option. Why is it not an option? Because dad is demanding that you get along. Your father doth speak. And I think, from just the earthly father perspective, that this, this is the essence of what Jesus was telling his followers in this passage. He said, this is a new command. This is not an option. This is not a suggestion. This is not a hope. This is a command. This is a command from God. You know, there were, there were 10 others like it on the other side of the Bible. Here's a new one. Love one another. Love one another. And this isn't. And I love you, but I don't have to like you. I think that's what some of his followers must have thought when he first said this. Because we experience this in our homes too, don't we? Oh, I'll love them, but I don't have to like them. I know I've heard that in the church. Love one another. Just picture this, if you will. <laughs> Just picture Thomas. Fine, Jesus. I'll love Peter, but I don't have to like Peter. He's always talking. He always thinks he knows it all. He even corrected you. And you said, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. I will love him, but I don't have to like him. Can you picture that happening with the disciples? I can. I mean, they were competing for who would get to sit at the right and the left hand of Jesus. So it's not really that far-fetched. But Jesus said, love one another. And then he builds off that idea to put the, the thought that I can love and not like. He puts this down. He's, this is what Jesus said. Now watch. He says, as I have loved you, you must love one another. That verse uh, 34 and 35, John 13. As I have loved you, you must love one another. So how much does Jesus love us? He left eternity and he paid for our sin with his own blood. He loves us as dear children. I guarantee you that Jesus isn't up at the right hand of the Father right now looking down and saying, I love Matt. I really don't like him. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say amen. But sometimes we, we get that idea that we have an excuse to do that sort of thing. And we don't have authorization by Jesus to live that way. We are to love people as Jesus loves us. So Jesus then gave a reason for the need to love. 
and be unified with one another as we saw in this passage. Everyone, the world, the community, your people, they will know that you are mine if. If, that's a conditional phrase. I taught English for a while in a, in a private school. It was not my favorite thing to do. But, but conditional phrases that we see in Scripture are very important because they're requirements. If you want something to happen, you have to do the other thing. They will know who? The world, the community, the people around you. They will know that you are followers of Jesus, followers of mine, as Jesus was saying, if you love one another. No love for each other and our community means no revelation that we are His. I'm going to say that again. No love for each other and our community means no revelation that we even belong to Him. Love for one another demonstrates to others our love for Christ. We cannot get around this. Love makes it possible to intentionally connect with each other and our community. So let's go to another passage before we move to our action points. Uh, John 17. So go ahead and just flip a few pages over. John 17. Jesus builds upon this idea in verses 20 to 23. John 17, 20 to 23. Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So first of all, press pause there real quick. If any of us thought we got off the hook with Christ's love command, think again. Here we see Jesus praying for his disciples and then praying for believers. And he doesn't just pray for believers who are with them in that moment. If you've got a highlighter, if you've got a pen, underline it. He prays for those who will believe. Guess who that includes? Us. This prayer of Christ, he prays for us that those who will believe will love. Okay, so verse 21, this part of Jesus praying. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's important. I have given them the glory that you gave me and they may be one that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know, watch this, highlight, underline, whatever you got to do. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So what he was saying is, may they share a unity with the Holy Spirit, Spirit in obedience and direction, and may they be unified with one another. And I just want you to catch what Jesus says twice in this prayer for believers. He says, may they be connected so that the world will believe that God sent Jesus. May they be unified so that the world will believe that God sent Jesus. So think about this for just a moment. How we connect with each other, according to Jesus, proclaims to the world Christ's purpose and message. How we connect with each other proclaims to the world Christ's purpose and message. And I submit to you, this is one of the major reasons the enemy is so insistent upon sowing discord and strife into churches because he knows that the community is watching and the community then gets an imperfect picture of Jesus when the church is battling itself. We must love one another. We must be unified. We must become intentionally connected. These are requirements of Jesus. All right, so I have laid the foundation. You ready now? So here's the question. What practical ways will we integrate this into our body on a continual basis? And here's the primary thought. I'm sorry, I'm so used to looking at the screen. You're just going to have to forgive me this morning. And I'll go a little bit slower for those that, that want to write these things down. Here's the primary question. And there's three points. So I'll read this a few times. So for those of you who are taking notes, you can write it. If you don't want to take notes this morning, you can welcome me. Or welcome. <laughs> I don't know where welcome and email come from, but you are welcome to email me, and I will send you the entire transcript of the message. So um, those of you who don't get writer's cramp while I'm preaching, I don't want you distracted. So here's the question. 
How are we going to become intentionally connected as a church? How are we going to become intentionally connected as a church? Here's the three points for this morning. We're going to refuse to allow the world's divisions to come into the church. We're going to refuse to allow the world's divisions to come into the church. Number two, we're going to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation. We're going to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation. And number three, we're, number two, we're going to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation. Number three, we are going to intentionally connect inside small groups and welcome new faces. We're going to intentionally connect inside small groups and welcome new faces. Let me pause for just a moment. Let me read those through one more time. Refuse to allow the world's divisions to come into the church. Embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation and intentionally connect inside small groups and welcome new faces. Let's go to that first point. We're going to refuse to allow the world's divisions to come into the church. If you haven't noticed, the nature of the world seeks to divide people. Have you watched the news recently? That's the nature of the world. Christ desires to bring us together. The world desires to divide us. You know, Paul, labeled under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul labeled Satan the God of this age or the God of this world, little g. We must, as a body of believers, recognize the enemy's tactics and don't play the game on his terms. Satan's tactics involve putting as many barriers between people as possible, both within and without the church, so that Christ's love will not be demonstrated. The enemy will divide based on race and ethnicity. He will divide based on socioeconomic status, family background, stereotypes, political affiliations, and so forth. He is all about dividing Dividing people. He wants, catch this, he wants to keep people separated by temporal things so that we don't embrace eternal things that bind us together. He wants to separate us based on temporal things. Because if we as a church would anchor ourselves to eternal things, it would change our conversations. It would change our connectivity. It would change how we even did church. Every division I just mentioned is temporal. What matters is the kingdom of God and the eternal destination of all people. If the enemy can get you mad at somebody because they voted differently than you, then your eyes have been taken off matters of eternity. Don't get frustrated over politics. And I hate to go here, but let me go here. It's going to get worse over the next year and a half. Amen. Amen. That's right. Can I just give you something that's free? Can I give you something free? We have to be Christians first, Americans second. Christians first, Americans second. If that gets flipped, we start fighting for temporal things before we fight for eternal things. That's free. Amen. We have to settle in our souls that Christ and his mission are primary and the divisions of the world are not. As a church, we have to refuse to allow the divisions of the world to infiltrate the body of Christ. And I think that's a major problem in our country right now. Rather than letting the unity and love and grace and forgiveness found in Christ radiate from our local churches across the country, we, many churches, have taken defensive positions within the house of God and allowed that division from the outside to come in. We've gotten scared. Okay, I'm going to give you some more free stuff. Is that okay? Because I don't have a clock, but I do have a microphone. No person or political party has the power to remove us from the love of Christ. We cannot be scared 
by the tactics that are being in, implemented through people of the enemy. We have to, again, as the church, recognize that our battle is not against flesh and blood. And we have to, again, go to the throne of grace and do battle in the heavenlies. The problem is, too many Christians today are better at fighting politics than they are in the spirit. I don't remember what I just said. It was free. It came out once, brother. (laughs) Many Christians, I'm going to say what I think I said. Many Christians today are better at fighting in politics. We're better arguing with people over on Facebook. We, mm -mm -mm. (laughs) We have more to say on Facebook than we do from our knees. Oh, boy. I have got to be careful. I'm going to take a drink so I don't jump all, all over that one. Hmm. Okay, Lord, where do you want me to go with that one? I'll let that one settle. I'll let that one settle in your soul. Because if we're more active on social media than we are in reaching to Jesus and pushing back the darkness, we've got our priorities backwards. Okay. I love you. I do. (laughs) We have to be willing to embrace people, regardless of their background, knowing that it's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who convicts and changes someone from darkness to light. Our responsibility is to anchor our souls to grace and truth and allow the power of Christ to unify us so that the world may know that he came and he loves them. The world's divisions have no place in the body of Christ. We must allow Christ to forge us to represent him to the community. Let's go to the second point. Embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation. May I tell you what brings me great joy today as I look out among all of you? Can I tell you? My heart is full. It's because I see people of every generation in our body. People of every generation in our body. We've got the silent generation, boomers, Gen X, millennials, And we have a bunch of Gen Z in rooms around this building. We are a five-generation church, and somebody in this room ought to celebrate and thank God for that, because that's not normal in a lot of places. Lord, we thank you for every generation. We thank Jesus that we've been blessed with every generation. We even have some Gen Alpha that have been born and more that are on the way. That will make us a six-generation church. That's awesome. That's awesome. And here's the truth. Every generation is valuable. Every generation is part of the body of Christ. Each generation has their own touch of creativity and wisdom associated with their time. Each generation is loved by Christ. Each generation is loved by our church. With that being said, what what God is asking of us is that we continue to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation within this body so that Christ's love may be demonstrated to our community. So here's the question I'm posing. How do we embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation? So let me today give you three practical ways. And yes, these are sub-points. In just a moment, I'll go to the last point. Let me give you three practical ways we're going to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation. Are you ready? First time, first point, we're going to do this with our words. We're going to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation with our words. You know, I am in an interesting season of life where I find myself smack dab in the middle of different generations. I relate quite a bit to the thoughts and ideals of those who are my seniors and those who are younger than I. I find it hard to believe that I am turning 40 this year. Not quite as old as Pastor Michael. (laughs) I'm turning 40 this year. It is what it is. My wife is trying to convince me that I need a birthday party. For those of you that know me, I hate birthday parties. (laughs) And Lord, those introverts among you, My ideal birthday is solitude. (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen. Solitude. So maybe this year I'll I'll, I'll let them stretch me. I've told her, I said, you can do a birthday every decade. 
We'll see how that works. One of the benefits of my stage of life is the privilege I have to connect with generations on both sides of mine. And I can tell you with absolute certainty, we have much to glean from each other. We have much to glean from each other. As a church body, we must engage differing generations with words of encouragement and kindness and grace. Here is what we cannot allow to be part of our language. We cannot complain about other generations. We act like this is a new thing in our time where where generations, one touts themselves and their ideals over another. But this has probably been going on since the beginning of time. I'm sure that Seth had some issues with Adam and Eve and and I could could picture Adam saying to Seth, Seth, you know, in our day, we actually walked with God. And I could see Seth say back, well, yeah, dad, but you ate the apple. (laughs) You know, I'm sure there was a back and forth through time. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And culture again likes to put people at odds with one another. And if we aren't careful, we allow this to come into the church. And strife often comes into the church through generational conflict. Ooh, catch that. I've been around long enough now that a lot of the strife that comes into the church is through generational conflict. A commitment we must make is that we will not allow our words about other generations to become negative. We will not complain. It's not okay to label a generation as out of touch. It's not okay to label another generation lazy. It's not okay. You're going to see that all over the place. We've got to stop negatively labeling other generations. Generations aren't that way. Individuals are. And in painting with a broad brush, we cripple our ability to influence anyone different than us. We must choose to honor every generation for how God has used them, how God will use them, and for the value they bring to the body of Christ. Second sub-point, how we're going to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation. We're going to do this with specific activities and ministries geared at honoring and equipping each generation. We will set ourselves up in such a way that we provide points of connection and growth for all generational demographics within our fellowship. We want to honor our seniors and provide opportunities for them to connect within the life of the church and be effective parts of the body. Amen? Amen. We want to do that. Nobody, hear me, hear me seniors, I love you. Nobody retires from the body of Christ. Nobody retires from the body of Christ. We desperately need the wisdom of our precious seniors to pour into our lives. Seniors, we need you. We need you. Older adults, we also need your hard work. We need your determination. We need the creativity and the energy of our younger adults. I'm finding I need this more and more because when I'm starting to get up, I'm getting sore. This is new for me. Don't laugh, but this is new for me. I'm starting to need some of the energy of the younger ones. Amen. We need those things. We are all in this together. So as a church, we desire to provide activities and ministries to honor and equip each generation. And I'm going to add this. As a church, we are going all in for youth and kids. We are going all in for youth or kids. That's, you know, the generation, if you look at statistics, 80% of people who get saved do so under the age of 20. We've got to focus on kids and we've got to focus on youth. Amen. They're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. They're one of these six generations that are part of our church. And our culture tomorrow will be determined by how well we impact Gen Z and Gen Alpha. So as a church, we will make a commitment to love, support, and develop these generations. Amen? Last sub-point before I go to the last point. How are we going to embrace, celebrate, and connect every generation? We're going to do this by intentionally connecting with people of a different generation. This is where we have to make a pivot. Not only do we want to honor the different generations and provide opportunities for growth, we also want to connect across generational lines. 
We must celebrate and equip and empower every generation while connecting them at the same time. So this is, you know, Sunday morning, this is one of the venues we do this. This is a venue where we have all generations in one place. We also do this through ministries and small groups. We are stronger when every generation is moving together. That is when we have our greatest strength, when we are moving together. So let me give you a very practical challenge for everybody here today. Here's my practical challenge from your pastor. Within the next month, get together with a family, a couple, or an individual who is from a completely different generation than yourself. Get together over coffee or food and just ask questions of each other. Just ask questions. Ask them about their life, their background. Ask them how life was lived when they were growing up. Um, And for some of you younger folks, as you are still growing up. Young people, ask our seniors what life was like back when they were kids. Hear me, they grew up in a totally different America. And young people, share what America is like today because it's a totally different America. We need to share these things as we engage one another. A totally new level of appreciation and honor will begin to develop and the result will be a much more dynamic connection in Christ as we fulfill our mission. And I'm going to add this. I want all my millennials and Gen Xers to listen up. I'm I'm in that group, so I'm included. Wherever you go to meet with someone older than you, if you go to coffee, if you go to lunch, if you want to pick their brains, millennials and Gen Xers, pick up the bill. (laughs) Honor older adults and seniors by treating them. That is a request from your pastor. And all our seniors said. Amen. <laughs> Last point. <laughs> Last point. We're going to intentionally connect inside small groups and welcome new faces. Here is our present reality as a church. Our dynamics are changing. Our dynamics are changing. This church has been, over the last several years, um, what we would call a family church. Um, And what, what I mean by family church is this. A family church is characterized by the ability of everybody to know everybody. Okay, when I say family church, that's what I mean. The ability of everybody to know everybody. Many churches stay that way. Because moving to a different level and adding more people becomes uncomfortable. People like their comfort zones. People like knowing each other's names. However, God is changing our dynamic and he is doing so rapidly. We are shifting from a family church to what is more like a generational or community church. God is bringing in people who are both looking for a church where they can connect, grow, and serve. But God is also bringing in people who really don't have a church background at all, but they're hungry for something only God can give. And let me tell you, that's awesome on both accounts. We need to reach the harvest, but we're also praying for harvesters. We have to change our paradigm or our way of thinking about connection. As God continues to give us more influence and we continue to reach the community, we have to be willing to welcome new faces and be okay not knowing everybody's name. Here's the truth that we've got to embrace. You may not get to know everybody, but get to know somebody well. I'm going to say that again. You may not get to know everybody, but get to know somebody well. This is why small groups are so important to the life of our church. Small groups, they create an opportunity to initiate better connectivity. As we grow bigger, as we reach more people, we must become smaller and provide intentional venues where people can get to know each other. I don't know about you, but I don't connect well with lots of people in a group at the same time. Anybody else relate with that? It's those moments one-on-one over coffee. It's those moments with just a small group of people. That's where we begin to share life together. And that's what we must emphasize as a church. You know, sometimes we forget. If you've been at a church for any length of time, you forget how difficult it is to step into a new place and know hardly anybody. 
we forget that because we become comfortable. Oh yeah, we know these people, we know these people. It's our little clique. If we're going to be who God has called us to be, we have to break out of cliques and be willing to embrace people as they come through our doors and bring them in to be part of our family. Amen? Amen. So there's a dilemma in many churches. And this is one that I don't think we're going to get stuck in, but it bears mentioning. Churches proclaim they want to make a difference in the community, but when the community begins to come, Comfort zones are broken, followed by a resistance to the influx of people. And let me say this, too many churches abort the prayers they've prayed because of comfort. They abort the answered prayers that come through their doors. Because it doesn't look like what they were expecting. It doesn't sound like what they were expecting. I've I've had um, the privilege... (laughs) And being a pastor for a while and being on staff for, man, I think I've been in the ministry now about 21 years. I know I don't look that old. (laughs) But I've been in those scenarios where I've heard complaints of people because children were too loud in children's church. May we never abort the answered prayers of God because they step over into our comfort zone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We have to shift away from the comfort of knowing everyone's name and embrace the thrill and the challenge of reaching more people for Christ. That's why we're here. We want to reach people for Christ. As I wrap this, I, I'm, I'm getting tired. <laughs> I know. <laughs> As I wrap up this point, moving to the closing of this message, let me remind all of us, I kind of started with this at the beginning, which is why we started in the scripture points where we did. One of the greatest struggles of people in the community, you know, we're we're familiar with struggles of addiction, we're familiar with struggles of broken homes, we're familiar with struggles of violence of all sorts, but one point of pain for our community we often forget, and yet so many of us have, for, have experienced individually, even while in a church body, is that of loneliness. Oh, yeah. The pain of loneliness. Can I tell you this morning that our community is lonely? Our community is lonely. There are many people that are just out there trying to make it from day to day to day and are struggling because they go home at night and feel like they have nobody they can call, nobody they can talk to. Our community is lonely. We have all these friends on Facebook, but we really don't connect with anyone. You know, the enemy, he seeks to isolate people. You know, he he isolates through different beliefs. He isolates through generational differences. He isolates through fear. He isolates through comfort and convenience and the refusal to change. Our community is lonely and isolated. And if the body of Christ is unwilling to intentionally connect with them, then who will? If not us, then who? If not now, then when? We must remember that connection isn't just a cup of coffee and a handshake. It is a belief system. We believe and we will connect. It is in our DNA. So as I sum all of this up, we will become intentionally connected with people because through our connection, Christ will be made known. So let me close with this verse and a thought. If you got your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 2. I want to read verses 42 to 47. Acts 2, 42 to 47. This is a passage found after the church was growing and growing rapidly. They were having to adapt frequently. In verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, it says, They, the followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord 
added to their number, number daily those who are being saved. What we see here, those relationships were not superficial. They were real. They took work. They took time to get to know one another and have their hearts forged in unity by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that is what Christ desires to do in and through Glad Tidings Church. As we become connected, as we connect to our community, the community will come to know that Jesus was sent for them, that Jesus loves them, and that we are his people. Amen.